time you were taken by your own free will, rejected and disowned by those you came to heal. Stripped of your clothes, you were mocked, you were beaten, made a king of fools. Crown of sorrow driven deep into your brow Yet you made no sound What you went through to love me I'll never understand What blows my mind away
And so we gather together tonight to soberly remember, to worship deeply, and then at the end, to leave quietly, remembering and reflecting on the sacrifice of Christ for you and for me. And as we do so, we know that we don't mourn without hope and we look forward to celebrating the blessed hope that we have at one of our five Easter weekend services. We hope and we pray to see you back this weekend, but tonight we pause. And as we pause, we look at the cross, remembering the brutality and the suffering of Christ, the, of Christ on the cross the place where God's judgment and his mercy collide. And as we do so, we look at ourselves remembering that it was my sin that held him there. We hear our voices cry out among the scoffers. And we have crafted our service tonight to give you space to do just that. During our time together, Pastor Josh will be preaching from Matthew's gospel in four different segments. And after each segment, our worship team will lead us in song. And during that time, you'll have the opportunity to stand and sing, kneel and pray, sit and reflect however the Lord leads you. And then as we leave tonight, it's my prayer that we will also hear our voices cry out, surely this man was the son of God. But let us prepare now to hear from God's word. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him. And they stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him and took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, he saved others, he cannot save himself. He is the king of Israel, let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God, let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I am the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Good evening. You know, an entire battalion uh, would have been some 600 soldiers. Uh, but a lot of commentators don't believe that Matthew was being so precise, regardless of how many there were, be it 600 or even simply 50, the ridicule that Jesus endured, it's almost unbearable to imagine. Uh, the pain, I think, too great for us to dwell upon. At this point, Pilate had already had Jesus scourged. It was a whipping with a multi-lashed whip, each strand embedded with 
shards of bone and metal. It would tear through the skin. It would expose bone and internal organs. The punishment itself was very often fatal. But as if the physical pain was not enough, then came the humiliation. Jesus was stripped and robed in scarlet. They twisted a corn of thorns and they forced it upon his head. They put a reed, their pitiful excuse for a scepter, in his hand. And kneeling before him, they cried out, Hail, King of the Jews. Which, ironically, is exactly who he was. And when they were finished, they had him dressed, and they led him off to crucify him. Now, in all probability, it wasn't a very long journey to Golgotha, the place of the skull. But since Romans forced the prisoner to carry their own cross, and given Jesus' lack of sleep, his loss of blood, not to mention the severe wounds that he had sustained, he was unable to make the journey. And so they compelled a man, Simon of Cyrene, to help Jesus carry the cross and take his last steps. Matthew's description of the crucifixion itself is is dramatically understated. He simply says, and when they had crucified him. That's it. Perhaps because his listeners were already vividly aware of crucifixion, that most brutal form of execution. Or perhaps because as awful as Matthew knew crucifixion to be, Perhaps, in the mocking of those who looked on, maybe for Matthew that was potentially the greater injustice. The soldiers, they mocked our Lord. I'm not sure that we can even comprehend the immense thirst that our Lord was experiencing. And what small relief it must have been to see a soldier extend to him some wine. Only to sip it and to realize that they had mockingly mixed that wine with gall, making it bitter and undrinkable. Just so they could laugh at his enthusiasm at getting a drink. And to have it taken away so quickly. As Jesus hung there in agony, they callously divided his garments among themselves by casting lots. And in doing so, unknowingly fulfill what Psalm 22 said was going to happen. And then they hung the charge against him above his head. This is Jesus, King of the Jews. Their laughter undoubtedly echoing in Jesus' ears. But it was not the only thing that Jesus had to listen to. Those that randomly were walking by that day, they took their shots at Christ as well. They scoffed at him. They were wagging their heads at him in disgust. And like Satan had tried before, They unknowingly tempted Jesus, saying, If you are the Son of God, 
come down from the cross. The tragic irony being that it was in fact because he was the son of God and out of obedience to his heavenly father that Jesus could not come down. And the chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the religious elite, they had their run at him too. They didn't even have the courtesy of, of addressing Jesus directly, but instead within earshot, talking about him in front of him, ensuring that he heard, would say he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross, and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now. If he desires him, for he said, I am the son of God. But on top of it all, in perhaps the greatest misplaced demonstration of moxie of all time, the two robbers crucified alongside Jesus, inexplicably they too join in the mocking of him and say the very same things that all the others had been saying about him. You know, I remember being um, about seven or eight and riding on a school bus. And I was in a seat by myself and so wanting to hang out. I remember kind of getting on my knees and leaning over that seat and talking to my friends that were in the row in front of me. And some older kids behind me they, they, they pulled my shorts to expose my, my little tidy whities for all to see. And, and as I recall, the funny thing about it is I, I actually remember people laughing before I realized what they had done. And I remember kind of pulling up my shorts and casting a dirty look at these guys and, you know, you guys are idiots or whatever I would have said. And then I got back up to talk to my friends and they did it again. I told them to quit it. I told them to stop. And they did it again. And and I remember just kind of sitting in my seat by myself, hearing the laughter around me, and all wishing I was larger and older to be able to do something about it. I was so embarrassed. I was angry. But there was nothing I could do. Jesus he he could have stopped it all. You know, we refer to that proverbial straw that broke the camel's back. But Jesus did not have to endure any of it. He he could have stopped them when they were whipping him. He held the very breath of those who were beating him in his hands. Jesus could have changed that bitter wine to water and given himself just a small little bit of physical relief. He could have made all those mockers mute. He could have, as the old song says, called 10,000 angels to make it stop. But he didn't. Jesus suffered all of that 
for us. He suffered that for you. There's a God who weeps, and there's a God who pleads. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. A hallelujah to the Son of Suffering. Some imagine you are distant.
Now from the sixth hour, there was a darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lemma sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man is calling Elijah. And one of them at once ran and took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the other said, wait, let us see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. You know, if we connect the various timestamps we have from the Gospels, it would seem that after a sleepless night of false trials and what must have felt like endless beatings, uh, Jesus was finally crucified somewhere mid-morning on Friday. And then, as things had been going, as everyone would have expected, around noon, things took an unexpected turn. The lights went out. Matthew says there was darkness over all the land. And for those who were present, it must, it must have been terrifying. Natural explanations as to the cause of such a thing, they all fall short. More probably, the cosmic significance of what was happening caused nature itself to respond. Causes nature itself to cry out. Which, at the ninth hour, or 3 p.m., according to our reckoning of time, that's exactly what Jesus does. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's maybe the most puzzling, or perhaps the most perplexing words in all of Scripture. On the surface of it, Jesus is simply quoting the first verse of Psalm 22. A psalm that though it, though it starts out dark, it does gain altitude quickly and end on a high note of victory. But Jesus knew that. And he doesn't quote the high bits. Time this evening will not permit us to dive into all the questions Jesus' statement raises. But even if we had unlimited time, personally, I would not be able to offer a reasoned response to them all. Jesus, God in the flesh, who never ever Stop being so. In some way experienced a severing of the relationship that he had enjoyed for eternity. As he took God's wrath upon himself for our sins. I certainly would not want to misspeak. And I believe that Jesus knows everything. But it does feel to me like in a real way. This, this caught him a little by surprise. That, that he didn't recognize fully in a way just how heavy the weight of our sin would be and what it would feel like for the first time to experience a distance between him and his heavenly father. And to add insult to injury, some of the bystanders, they, they misheard what Jesus was saying. And they thought he was calling for Elijah. 
uh, because in Hebrew, uh, Elijah sounds a lot like God does in Aramaic. And so when a bystander goes to give him a drink, the crowd stops him because they want to see if Jesus' suffering would actually make Elijah do something. And that'd be kind of cool to see. Which brings us to verse 50, which for me has hit very hard this week. It says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And why does it hit so hard? I think, I think it was for me the realization that I can, I, can, I can sing it often without thinking about the reality of the words that I sing, that it was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. It was that dying breath that brought me life. You know, the Titanic famously went out without enough lifeboats to rescue everybody should it go down. But Jesus stayed upon that cross and he chose not to end his suffering until he had paid for it all. Until he had paid the penalty for all of our sin. Let's continue. Jesus, our 
And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with them, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, Truly, this was the Son of God. And there were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Joseph and the mother of the sons of Zebedee. That section does raise a question or two. But creation and those who were in the know all testify to the unprecedented circumstances that surrounded the death of the Son of God when he finally chose to give up his spirit. The curtain of the temple Uh, The curtain that separated the holy place from the most holy place was torn in two from top to bottom, thereby taking away that barrier between us and our most holy God. And the earth itself responded. He gave up his spirit and the earth began to shake. And rocks were split as it trembled at the death of its creator. And tombs were opened. It is surreal. And Matthew is the only author to record the event, and very briefly so. But at Christ's death, Tombs that had been shut seemingly for centuries were opened. And then upon Jesus' resurrection, those bodies got up and went into the holy city. And I would have loved to have seen the looks on people's faces that day. But but I think most touching of all, are those centurions and those who were with him. The hardened soldiers that they were and people who were not unfamiliar with witnessing crucifixions. Because when they saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe and said, truly, this was the Son of God. I know we all probably, most likely, have some people in our lives that we believe will never change. People we believe will never come to faith in Jesus. But I do think we'd all have to agree that the very ones who crucified Jesus who cast lots for his garments, who cruelly mocked him and casually sat back to watch him die. I mean, they'd have to qualify as particularly hard cases, would they not? But the death of Jesus changed them. Jesus. Jesus changed them, has he changed you? And might might it be a good time to sit in a bit on what we've been reflecting upon. 
Matthew does not record any disciples being present, but only some of the women who had cared for Jesus from the beginning. Presumably, it was their testimony that went forth and let the gospel writers know what happened. But Matthew tells us that they were there. And I quote, looking on from a distance. And in a real way, so are we. We were looking on upon the crucifixion of Jesus Christ some 2,000 plus years later. But we too want to look upon him. We want to consider what he endured for us. And we're going to take a minute in silent reflection to do just that. Thank you. 
also was a disciple of Jesus. He went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it to be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut in the rock. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there, sitting opposite the tomb. Joseph, we know from the Gospels, from Luke, was a member of the Sanhedrin. Now, that was the ruling body that had sentenced Jesus to death. But Luke tells us that Joseph had not consented to their verdict. But that, that is pretty much all, all we know. Uh, Joseph of Arimathea... He is not mentioned anywhere else in the New Testament apart from his appearance at the burial of Jesus. And all four of the Gospels do include his appearance there. Now certainly he was rich. To have a personal tomb back then and to have the resources for such an elaborate burial... The guy had some money. And obviously, he was someone of of some social standing. Uh, Regular people did not just generally roll up to Pilate, especially on such short notice. The Apostle John points out that Joseph had secretly been a disciple of Jesus. But secretly for fear of the Jews. That being the case, he certainly picked one heck of a time to go public. Instead of thinking I dodged a bullet, I cannot believe I almost threw my support behind that guy. It's when Jesus dies that Joseph goes forward. And it was not just a financial cost. It wasn't simply his standing in society. By law, those who were convicted of treason, by law, they were not allowed a proper burial. They had to have been thrown into an unmarked common grave. And here goes Joseph asking for the body of one so convicted. To give Jesus the proper burial he deserved. And we're not sure why. Maybe Pilate's whole discomfort with the thing, maybe just to throw some shade at the ruling court. Pilate agrees and lets Joseph take Jesus' body. And he took it and he wrapped it in a clean linen shroud. He laid Jesus in the spot that he thought one day his family would be laying him. And he rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb. And he went away with Mary Magdalene and the other Mary seated there opposite the tomb and watching it all go down. I wish 
we knew a little more as to how it did go down for Joseph. Why after so long of staying secret, why was it at this moment, at this time, that he decided to make his allegiance known? Was it when the sky went dark that he knew something was up? Was it at the earthquake? Had he already been on his way? Did his wife support him or was she upset? Whatever it is, he is the last person we know of to identify with the earthly Jesus. And Joseph chose to do it when he was dead. And we too, we are called to identify with Jesus. And we are told not just to celebrate the glorious upside of the faith, but to pause and to remember and to identify with him in his death. The Apostle Paul said, For I received from the Lord what I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And this evening, we want to do just that. We want to proclaim the Lord's death and to do this until he returns. Jesus Christ gave his body for you. He gave it upon a tree. He endured humiliation and mocking, physical pain that we can not comprehend, and inexplicably somehow took the wrath of God for your sins upon himself. Jesus shed his blood for you. Real blood. Human blood. For the forgiveness of your sins. For the forgiveness of my sins. And to identify with him in that, you need to confess him for who he is. And you need to acknowledge what he's done for you. And typically a pastor would say, you know, we wait to the gospel message for, for, for Easter. But Jesus' death impacted some centurions. And maybe this night, his death will impact you. We're going to give you a moment to reflect. Our servers will come forward and hand out the elements. If you do not know the Lord, we'd ask you just to hand them to the person next to you. But different than our regular services, we want to give you time to process on your own. And so as soon as you have the elements, feel free to reflect and to pray. And when you are ready to participate in taking the elements on your own, or perhaps with those you came with, and we will worship and we will conclude our service. So servers, come forward, please. And when you get the elements, take your time and participate when you're ready. to trade this in.
close with one last song. We invite you all to stand with us. Let's worship our Lord. Thank you so much for joining us in this time of repentance. Normally, we end our services by reading a benediction from the book of Jude. But tonight is not the end. There is so much more to this story. And so we would love for you to join us on one of our Easter services, either tomorrow or on Sunday. And as we leave tonight in silence, may we ponder the great sacrifice that Christ made for every one of us in this room. You are dismissed.